Good morning, Christopher Robin. Oh, good morning, Winnie the Pooh. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and my crazy holiday calendar says today is sourest day. But here in the basement, we just call it a weekday. So today, we'll ditch the usual Friday format and get your party hats on, people, because we're rolling out a game show. Today, we welcome from the Side Hustle Show, Chief Side Hustler, Nick Loper. And from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. Plus, from this podcast, Oh, gee. And are you a home renter or landlord? During halftime, Joe will ring up the guy with all the insider tips for renters, the author behind Rental Secrets, Justin Pogue. Nah, don't worry. We'll still save time to answer a voicemail on our Magnify Money segment and share some of my sourest day themed trivia. And now, a guy who might want to think about starting a lemonade stand to support his podcasting hobby, Joe Salsiha. I don't know. That's got to be, that's got to be better than all the money that we make here in podcasting world. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Stacky Benjamins. I am Joe Salsiha. I average Joe Money on Twitter. It's amazing the crowd we've got here. We've got a fantastic group of people but first let's introduce the gentleman who is uh at the end of the card table here with me my good friend og what's happening man you know same stuff different day feels like deja vu same stuff different minute (laughs) feels like it for people new to this party we recorded this about uh i'm gonna say uh five minutes ago and uh it turned out a cord wasn't hooked up right yeah operator error yeah so sorry my bad how are you doing this time as well as last time it is not better (laughs) Fantastic. And somebody who's probably doing way better than she was doing a couple of minutes ago in uh, Las Vegas on the shortwave. It's our good friend, Paula Pant. I'm doing so well. Now that we're doing this a second time, I've had time to think about what to say. I know all my lines. Oh, yeah. I am more prepared for this episode of Stacking Benjamins than I have been (laughs) ever in the history of Stacking Benjamins. (laughs) Which, by the way, I get the subtext there, Paula. You're prepared because we've already done five minutes of this. (laughs) <laughs> which means the longest you've ever prepared for a show is got to be it's four minutes, four and a half minutes. Well, I feel good. That's like three and a half minutes more than OG prepares. So <laughs> that's fantastic. But I feel bad. Last time we had this whole thing about South and West, we had like a history of Las Vegas from Paula. I nearly <laughs> cried. It was amazing. It was fantastic. But you know what else is amazing is that we have the man himself here, the man behind Side Hustle Nation, the chief side hustler, Mr. Nick Loper. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Nothing's going on, man. We just thought we'd introduce you again. It's fantastic. You see the way real pros do it, Nick? I love it. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, tell the three people that don't know about Side Hustle Nation, the Side Hustle Show, uh, what you do. My job is to find people with interesting side hustle stories and share those on the podcast, which we've been doing every week since 2013. So 350 something episodes into the show at this point, tons and tons of creative business ideas and just ways I never thought of uh, that you can make money outside of your day job and the marketing tactics uh, that go along with it. So that's my main focus these days. I love your show because every single episode is something totally different. It's got to be fun talking to such a wide array of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Good stuff. You, by the way, speaking of lemonade stands, you were telling us earlier before we recorded about a dude who started a lemonade stand and was making buku bucks. Yeah, this was an introduction from actually another show that I was interviewed on. And he was like, oh, you got to talk to this guy. He's got a crazy story. And so I look him up and started his first lemonade stand at 22 years old. So this was not like a childhood thing, but has gone on to sell lemonade at Bonnaroo and Coachella and Woodstock. And this was like started on the side from a bartending gig. He's like, I know how to mix drinks. I mix lemonade in my spare time and has done seven figures in this. And his whole goal was like, I want to work the summer season. So I got the winners off to go skiing, go snowboarding. It's like, this is an awesome, I mean, it's lemonade. Like what a cool business. Do your fans listening to the show 
Is there something they need to worry about? You, you going to change gears and start doing that instead? This is the danger of being the host. And I know that's the mark of a good episode when I hang up saying like, I could totally do that. I should totally do that. <laughs> I know. You know what else is risky, Nick? Going out in public without deodorant. You ever done that before? Love it. Love it. Great, great transition there. <laughs> what, what, that, that, was that a transition? I, I didn't even notice. Oh, look at this. I can't believe this. Thanks to Native for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Native makes safe, simple, effective products that people use in the bathroom every day with trusted ingredients and trusted performance. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and enter promo code SB during checkout. 20% off. And also, by the way, as if that's not enough, but wait, there's more. Thanks to QuickBooks for supporting Stacky Benjamin. Save time and money when you use Intuit QuickBooks for your financial management needs. You can save an average of $600 a year. Six Benjamins, OG, by paying your employees with Intuit QuickBooks payroll. Check it out today at intuit.me. That's intuit.me slash SB. All right, we save people money. Everybody's introduced. We got that out of the way. We got a big party today, so let's get this started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. All right, Paula, you know what time it is? It's dinner time. It is game show time. It might be dinner time. And the crowd goes wild. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another fun episode of Stacky Benjamins, the video game. Actually, the podcast game, the game show. I don't know. One of those. Any of those. Pick one. You're making this up as you go. I am. Can you tell? No. Without a script. It's it's pretty amazing. <laughs> you literally have a piece of paper that's blank in front of you <laughs> that you're holding that looks like it's like something that's meant to have something written I'm, on it. I'm trying to hold it this way so that you can't look at the answers. Oh. Because I know you. The uh, uh, <laughs> You think I'm a cheater? Because we have. <laughs> That's what you're saying? He's like, I would have I would have cheated on this podcast a long time ago. If I was a cheater, uh, we, we got this piece from Inc. And it was written by Kathy Hughey. Kathy wrote nine questions to ask yourself before starting a startup. Now, not only did I like these questions, I also thought, well, heck, we got Nick Loper here, right? So we're talking about side hustles. We're talking about entrepreneurship. If anybody is thinking about starting a side hustle or starting as an entrepreneur, what are the nine questions they should ask themselves. And by the way, I should be clear, these questions are about becoming an entrepreneur, starting a startup, not necessarily just a side hustle. So we've got, uh, Nick, you're the guest here. Would you like to go first in the middle or last in the first round? That's that's a hard pass. I want to see what somebody else comes up with first. (laughs) How about Paula? I'll go first. All right. That sounds great. Deal. Uh, Paula, Nine questions to ask yourself. By the way, everybody, the way we play this, we should explain the rules, shouldn't we? We're going to play two rounds of this game. In the first round, it's one point per correct answer. Second round, two amazing points per correct answer. So, Paula, nine questions Kathy has on this list. By the way, it doesn't matter if your answer is awesome or not. All that matters is... Which it will be. Of course, (laughs) duh. It just matters that it matches this list. All right? So, them's the rules. What question should you ask yourself before starting a startup, Paula Pant? I am going to guess that a question you should ask yourself is, do I have the time to dedicate to this? All right. Is, do I have the time to dedicate to this on the list? (laughs) Kathy writes, the spoiler, probably not. Like having a child or getting married, there's never a perfect time to launch a startup. So the question is actually, do you have time for this anyway? Paula, before you started working for yourself, did you give any thought to that? To whether or not I had time for it, you know, I began freelancing while I was still at my day job. And my day job, after I had been there for a while, what I was doing became, I don't want to say routine, but I just got more efficient at it. So at the time that I began freelancing, I I, I didn't feel pressed for time. I think I had more time back then than I do now. Oh. Okay. And even after you started then? Yeah. 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 After I started, um, certainly I got busier because then I was balancing a day job with freelancing, but it all just felt fairly manageable. I don't know. Maybe I was better at managing my time back then, or, or maybe I just was doing less. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I certainly feel a lot busier now. 
I would imagine, Nick, though, that Paul is the exception, not the rule. Like if you've got a family and you have a full time job and you're thinking about going off on your own, it's tough. You got to carve out time. It is. You got to make the time. Otherwise, you're not just going to roll up at the end of the evening and say, this is my leftover time. Or if you do, you're not going to have the energy to move anything forward during that time. But it's kind of like anything else. Like if it's truly a priority, you'll figure out how to make time for it. Well, do you find that with some entrepreneurs, it comes at the expense of family, like their relationships deteriorate because of it? I saw this circulating a while and it was like, you can have, you know, health, wealth, or family, like pick two kind of a thing. And I was like, I don't know about that. I think there's a way to structure things such that everything has its place and it may take you longer, right? It may take you longer to build this business, to, to create this startup, but There's definitely a way to make meaningful progress in the time that you have. As he's talking, OG, I'm thinking about you've you've shared with me a lot about you and your sessions with your coach and about how that's kind of what you work on. We have to, as you build your business, continue to work on higher producing activities because otherwise you just do run out of time. Whether you start out making cakes and then you realize there's other stuff associated with the business you can't make, as your business grows, more and more cakes. You have to hire people to make cakes so that you can now supervise cake making and so on and so forth. So it changes the dynamic of it pretty quickly. But like Nick said, you got to figure out what's your priority. And I don't know who said this, but it's either a priority or anti-priority, right? And it's like your family is an important thing. Then you just have to put that in the big rocks first. You have to put that in the schedule first and then let everything else work around it. Yeah. All right, Nick, you are up next. There's eight left on the list. Paula, by the way, yours was number one on the list. Nice job. Oh, nice. Well, then it's good that I guessed it first. So, Very appropriate. Yeah, so the pressure's on, Nick, to guess number two now. <laughs> <laughs> number two, number two. My guess would be, what is your why? Like, what is your driving motivation behind trying to bring this new thing into the world? Is what is your why on Kathy's list? Nice. She it's by the way, number nine on the list. So she ends with a big finale. So Nick gets the big, the big, so what at the end of it. And Paula gets the first one. Nice job guys. She calls it, what's your mission? And she says, no, really, what is your mission? We're building this company to sell, or we want to make X millions of dollars may actually be your end goal, but that's different than your mission. Think of it like an hourglass at one end of the hourglass from the top to the middle or all the streams of motivation and input that inform your interest in this particular business category. The opposite end at the bottom is your end goal, which may in fact be building the business to sell in between at the waist of the hourglass is your mission. It's the skinniest part for a reason, which is the narrowly defined unique value that your startup adds to the ecosystem of its category. What can you do that no one else can do as well that will ultimately add value to a specific type of customer? And most importantly, why do you want to do it? Your mission lies right at the sweet spot. You kind of see life that way, Nick, when you're talking to entrepreneurs? I think that can't really be overlooked because there are so many different business models and even like, you know, off the shelf business models, like, well, just I won't replicate what these guys over here did. Right. But if you don't care about it, like if you don't care about the customers and why you're doing it, because it's hard, (laughs) if you're, if you're carving out that time, maybe it's from five 30 to six 30 in the morning to make that happen. It's incredibly easy to just hit that snooze alarm. If you don't care about it enough. I got to think, Paula, that's the reason why podcasters, you know, on average fade out after about seven episodes. They have a little something to say, but after seven episodes, it gets a little tougher. You know, I think a lot of people with podcasting specifically, a lot of people might think or assume that you just show up to the microphone and you talk. And the reality of that's it, not what as... we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. Show up we to the t- microphone. And yes. Uh, up for... We talk and we have cheesy music. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Exactly. But that cheesy music needs to be sourced. We need to make sure that it's royalty free and uncopyrighted. And, you know, there are all of those little questions and factors that go behind planning a podcast. And I think that when people discover that, and I don't mean to be insular about podcasting, this is true of any industry. What you see on the surface, the most publicly visible work that a person does is the tip of the iceberg. But when you get into what that work is, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in any field. And so you have to really be motivated 
um, in order to be able to deal with everything under the surface. Well, OG and I, a couple of weeks ago on uh, one of our, I think, uh, Wednesday show, we were talking about uh, multi-level marketing. I think that's why, Paula, so many people fail in multi-level marketing is instead of focusing on the value in the product in that middle of the hourglass, they're focusing on all the other things, which is why I think they said 50% of people give up within the first six months. Oh, well, I mean, I'm not a big fan of MLM uh, programs. So I think multi-level marketing has many flaws with it, uh, but certainly motivation, you know, um, getting into it for the wrong reasons. I think anytime that you're trying to do something purely for the money, that is not going to be a long-term sustainable motivation. I mean, it might be for a short period of time, particularly if you are going through a financial hardship and you really need the money, that can be incredible motivation, but that's, I don't think the thing that's going to sustain you for decades. Yeah. I think, OG, if you're creating a new company, it's got to be something. But then I think to counterpoint Paula, I met a guy who established a new company making stop signs and ended up, he worked with all kinds of, of uh, municipalities this guy's not passionate. There's no way somebody's like, that's a better red. Like this, <laughs> this, this, how many sides of the, this octagon's better than anyone I've ever. white outline around it. Yes. That'll really mm-hmm. confuse him. Yes. You'll know my stop signs mm-hmm. because they're different. So, I mean, what's it all about for him then? Well, I was going to say, this is a good segue, believe it or not, because I was going to say my answer is, am I going to make money doing it? You know, we talk about mission and we talk about changing the world and all that sort of stuff. But if you're starting a business, it has to serve some financial need or better anyway, otherwise, or you already are financially independent. So is my answer on the list? Oh, oh, you're, you're I, that like literally was a segue. I know you're just, it's such a foreign concept to you I thought to put we... those two things together into one coherent thought. I thought you're just, so that's your answer. My answer is, can I make money doing it? Can I make money doing this? It's number four on the list. Okay. Yeah. So Nick goes, I like this. Paula starts at the top. Nick goes to the bottom. OG splits the uprights. Kathy writes, where will the money come from for your startup cost? Consider basic things like marketing collateral, office space, travel expenses, all the way to the tools or equipment that are specific to your industry. Also, how are you going to make money in this industry? And if you've been ramping up the business as a side hustle while keeping your day job, keep in mind all the perks of an established business that'll no longer be available to you once you're once you're on your own. In other words, I have to make enough money, not just enough to sustain myself, but also for health insurance, yeah. benefits, all that stuff. Well, I didn't think about the first part that she said about, like, wh- where am I going to get the money to start this darn thing out of? Yeah. But yeah, that's a really big thing, too. I think when it comes to the financial side of things, a lot of people just look at the idea. Nick was talking about this. Like, oh, I can do this. But they don't see all the other stuff that's going into it, you know, and if you don't have the passion and you don't have the money to support it, you're going to end up kind of fizzling out. So so I think there's a little bit of a combination between those two. Nick, you know, we hear about doing a business plan at the beginning of a business. How often when you talk to people, is that really at the beginning of business in real life? For the people that I talk to, probably very, very few. That, that's what I thought. At, at most, you know, it's going to be like kind of a back of the napkin business plan, not some 30-page document that you're going to take to uh, to a bank and ask for money for. And why is that, do you think? It's just a different mentality. Like business plans are best suited for companies that need or or maybe they perceive the need to raise outside capital versus a more bootstrapped operation that is just like, I have this innate sense of what I'm going to bring into the world and who it's going to serve. And I can go out and do that without wasting my time to write this document. Like if it makes you feel better, great, but like don't spend weeks and weeks and months on it. Go go prove your business. Like go find a customer first. So it's um this concept of minimum viable product? Yes. Which means I guess I should explain that, shouldn't I? For the people that don't know what Nick and I are talking about. Like go prove at the very least that you can make some money doing this. Yeah. And there's a risk in going too far down the path without a plan in place, without a plan in mind. Because it goes back to what OG was saying, like, how how does this business make money? Like, you know, step step one, do the thing. Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. <laughs> and it's like, well, what happens in the middle there? Paula, how much of a business plan did you have when you went off on your own? None whatsoever. Nothing at all. Yeah. 
I just think, oh, gee, that's the average person too. Don't you think Nick's got it? Like if somebody's going to write people up- don't have financial plans for their lives. Yeah. How are they going to like sit down and make business plans yeah. for their businesses? Good point. Guess what we did? We got done with the first round of this thing. And the score, I think, Paula, last time we did this, the score is like zero, 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 wasn't it? I think so, yeah. The first time, the last time that we did this, um, nothing that anybody guessed was on the list. Now we're three for three. It makes me wonder what the second round's going to be like. We're going to have that a little later in the show. But first, how about if you're a renter? Is there a way to save some money on the rent that you pay? I never thought of being a renter and uh, saving money on your rent. But Justin Pogue's a guy who's thought about that. This is also, by the way, a great segment if you are a landlord or you're thinking about becoming a landlord. Uh, Justin Pogue going to explain all the ways that you can make renting work for you. He's coming down to the basement right now. And here coming down the stairs, it's our new friend, Justin Pogue. How are you, man? I'm doing great, Joe. How are you? Well, I'm doing much better now that you're here because I never thought about the fact, and I rented for a good part of my life, that I could have been doing much better. And then I hear about your work and I read your book and I go, there was a bunch of money sitting on the table and I got none of it. But you and I, in the next 10 to 12 minutes, we can help some other people not lose that money. But let me ask you this first. Were you somebody that negotiated with your landlord as you were renting or did you see an opportunity in the market? Did you realize there was, a, tell me about the origin of, uh, of your work on this. When I was a renter, I actually did not know any of these concepts. This came about later after I became a landlord and started working in, in property management, property development, which I've been doing since 2003. Um, and in fact, the last job I had, I was working for a corporation managing 200 apartments for them in San Jose, California, which really gave me a front seat to the frustrations and the helplessness and hopelessness that a lot of renters feel as far as what they're paying for rent and the situations that they're dealing with. But I found something interesting, and that was as I'm reading through your book, I'm thinking this isn't just good, though, for renters who have a lot of frustrations, to your point. This is also good for landlords to really not just have empathy, but to also maybe know, uh, know strategies about how to price places right, be a part of a community, things like that. Absolutely. What a lot of landlords think about like on the very surface level is I want to charge as much as possible for my property. I've jumped through all these hoops to get it. But what they're not thinking about is when you charge top dollar for your place, they're going to call you for every light bulb that goes out, every faucet that ever drips, every little thing they're going to call you for to come fix because they feel they're entitled because they're paying that top dollar. Whereas if you backed off even 50 or 100 bucks a month, depending on what market you're in, they may take care of those things themselves and not call you and put you through the, the ringer of having to get three quotes and be there when the contractor shows up and arrange all of that. The, the tenant may handle that themselves for you if you set up that arrangement beforehand. Reduces the landlord's stress, reduces the costs that they're going to be dealing with, and quite frankly, increases the profitability of the property, which is where the actual, which is one of the appraisal methods for real estate yeah. is what is how profitable is the property. Well, I'm also thinking something else too, and that is that when you charge top dollar, the chance that you're going to turn over that renter quicker increases. And there has to be, and I'm sure in property management, you guys know all about this. There's a cost associated with getting in a brand new tenant, I would imagine, versus keeping the same one happy for a longer period of time. Absolutely. So your first cost is going to be lost rent. Every day that apartment is vacant, not only are you not getting paid, but you can never get that money back. Yeah. It's not like a car where if I don't sell it today, I can sell it tomorrow. Right. So lost rent is the first place where you're losing money. Second place you're losing money is you have to come in and do repairs and fix up the property, whatever damages may have occurred. Some of that may be covered by the previous tenant security deposit. Some of that may not be. And then you may need to actually do some updating to the property to make sure that it's current with whatever's going on in the marketplace, you know, as far as being you know, better countertops or, you know, whatnot like that. So there are a lot of costs 
that landlords incur when you actually turn over a unit. And all of that comes straight out of your bottom line. Well, let's talk from the, not from the landlord's point of view, but from a renter's point of view, you go through a lot of different powers in your book that a renter has. And being a former renter, I always felt I was kind of powerless, but you say there's a lot. And I want to, I want to just cover today, just chapter one, because I think we can dig into that. And this is this idea Mm -hmm. of, of negotiating that you can actually possibly just in negotiate your rent. Tell me how that works. Cause I think a lot of people listening to this probably afraid to negotiate when it comes to working with a landlord. Yeah. And they really shouldn't be. I mean, the landlord's a person just like you are. They've got issues and situations that they're dealing with on their side. One of the things about the real estate industry is it's very fragmented. So like if you think about the car industry, for instance, there are like five companies that run the whole show pretty much. Well, in real estate, there are thousands upon thousands of landlords. They're all in different situations. Even the biggest companies, they'll have maybe 400, 500,000 apartments. But when you think about it, there's 40 million rental households across the country. So it's a, the large companies are just a drop in the bucket. So you're dealing with a lot of different landlords who have a lot of different situations on their end. They may owe taxes to the IRS. Their daughter may be getting married next month and they need somebody in their rental place like right now. So you don't know until you ask because they're not volunteering that information. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is landlords are dealing with problems, problems of problems of vacancy, problems of stress level, other things that are going on in their life unrelated to the property. And if you can reduce those stress levels or you can solve those vacancy issues, that is helpful to them. And if you can, if you're also interested in staying there longer term, that is also helpful to them. Um, so those are those are some specific things that, that individuals can do. But I also want to touch on this concept of social capital, which you're using now. You're, you're down in your mom's basement. You're paying her in terms of love hugs and telling her cookies are great, even if they're burnt. <laughs> and that reduces the amount that she's charging you to use this space. Yeah, don't bring um, up the word rent. The same, if, if, if you bring no. up the word rent with mom, our, our friendship ends right now, Justin. No, no, we're not, we're not even bringing that up. But the idea is that you are satisfying the needs that she has in some other way. Yeah. And the same concept can apply to people who are out renting, building that social capital as, as a renter where you're cleaning up after your pet. You are following the community rules. You're not playing your drums at 3 a.m. and keeping all the other residents up because one bad resident can ruin a landlord's investment and drive the other quality residents out, which decreases the value of their property. I'm glad you brought that up because I hadn't even thought about this. And this is a big theme of yours is creating quality neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's looking for a great place to live by following those rules and developing relationships, not only with the landlord, but also with your neighbors. You're creating a place that you want to come home to. And quite frankly, other people are going to want to come home to, which enhances the value of the landlord's property. But it also makes it a great place for the people who are actually living there. As you know, there's lots of different types of landlords. There are people like me who own one house besides mine. Mm -hmm. So I have one tenant. Uh, there mm-hmm. are people, maybe they listen to our friends uh, over at Bigger Pockets and they have seven, eight, maybe 10 places. And then there's the big companies out there that you were mentioning. Yeah. Who's the most likely to negotiate with you? All of them will negotiate with you. The trick is how do you present your case when you're ready to negotiate? The individual landlord, he's the one who's managing his own property. He's the one who is likely under the most stress most interested in finding that quality resident because that person likely has another job that they're trying to do. So coming in and fixing things and holding open houses to find new tenants, it's like they don't really have time for that process. So they're kind of the easiest to negotiate with because they've got situations that they're trying to handle separate from the actual property. Property owners who may own 10, 12 kind of units or houses They are a little more sophisticated, but if they're still managing themselves, they're still under some of those same stresses. Now, where you really get a shift in how you have to present your case is when you're dealing with the larger corporations, because that individual that's sitting in the leasing office 
probably can't negotiate too much. But what I talk about in the book is, let's say you get a renewal notice and it's more than you want to pay. So you're open to this negotiation concept. So the idea is you chose this particular building because it's probably about a half hour from your job. Let's say it's a half hour west of your job. But chances are there are some other communities that you would likely choose to live in that are similar that are a half hour east of your job. Unfortunately, your landlord's not looking at those because they're looking at rent comparables within about a mile of where they are. That's how they determine what they mean when they say our rents are co- our rents are comparable to the market. Mm-hmm. They're looking at what's about a mile around their property, similar properties, that kind of thing. And here's the thing. They do that because they can't move the building. That's the market they're stuck with. But you as the renter, you can move. So yeah, you could move. You can move closer to work. You've got this whole half hour yeah. drive between you and work. Yeah. yeah. Or you could move a half hour the other direction from work. Yeah. There's likely communities over there. So gather some market data from those other communities and then come back into that office and say, well, you wanted to raise my rent, you know, $300 a month, but there are comparable communities out there that will charge me less than what you're asking for. I want to stay here. I mean, I enjoy the community, but this is what's out there in the marketplace that I can take advantage of. Now, that is a case that they can take to their manager and present it and not seem like I'm just bringing this whining resident's complaint to you, but this is actual market information and data that's relevant to us if we're going to make this property work. And there's so many points you bring up there, Justin. Number one, whenever you're negotiating anything, bringing hard data always beats just bringing emotion, right? I mean, that's number one. Yeah. Number two thing is, and I love this and I'd never thought about this until you presented this, which is that that property manager is working with a busy owner And they don't want to call them all the time. However, when you present them this thing, they're going to have to take it to their owner. So they're going to have to, in some ways, kind of be on your team. Like they're going to Mm -hmm. go, hey, I don't want to bother you, but I've got this situation. And I was just thinking that maybe we, you know, this guy would be great or this woman would be great in my apartment, in the apartment building or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like taking advantage of this other relationship is also in your corner. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the relationships are really important when you're going to negotiate, because if I have a relationship with you and we're going to negotiate something, you're already open to that. Yeah. If I know that you're disturbing the other residents and you're causing a bunch of problems, I'm not inclined to cut you any kind of break. (laughs) Um, You know, this is this is going to be the deal. In a way, you're paying kind of a tax for me to have to put up with you. And I think a lot of people, especially young people, don't understand how much that can cost them in terms of this rental process. I'm thinking about the number of times this would have saved me money. And you have a an example in the book where the negotiator, the renter, saves $50 a month. Mm-hmm. $50 a month doesn't seem like a lot initially, but that's 600 bucks a year. And you're like, yeah. hey, if you've got a car payment, then that covers a few car payments a year. I mean- Every, yeah. every bit counts and how much you probably had to go sign the new contract anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, why not ask them to cut the number? Yeah, no, it's funny because when people talk about, oh, we want you, you know, learn how to save money. So cut out that Starbucks latte every day. So here's the problem. I'm passing by Starbucks every day. So in my mind, I'm having this conversation with myself about do I latte? Do I not latte? Blah, blah, blah. As I'm passing Starbucks <laughs> and that's happening every day. You know, with the lease negotiation, you negotiated once. It's an autopilot for the whole year. You don't have to think about it anymore. Done. It's already set, done, handled. So that 50 bucks a month turns into that 600 and, you know, six Benjamins is better than zero. <laughs> so, you know, now you have some options if you want to, you know, make car payments or, you know, start an investment account. Yeah. Success stories of people that have read the book. You must have some success stories coming in now. Yeah, I've had one college student who actually said that he was able to reach a happy medium with his landlord by using information that was in the book. I've had a landlord contact me and he said, you know, absolutely, landlords need to read this book, especially the smaller ones that are just getting started, because there are all these real estate seminars out there and all these gurus are out there singing the praises of real estate. And what they're saying is true except they're leaving out 
the stresses and a lot of the situations that you're going to be dealing with. They just assume you'll have people to handle that for you. Well, maybe you will and maybe you won't, but by not bringing it up in a certain sense, they're setting up people to fail, Yeah, which is not where people need to be, especially on their first property. Cause that is having gone through it myself. That's an emotional process yeah. to buy that first property to sign that stack of paperwork that they bring in. By the way, that stack of paperwork that you have not seen until that day. Right. Uh, yeah. Which drives me crazy. Um, we always try to get it a day before. When I was a financial planner, we tried to get it a day before back in the day. And every time the title company's like, what? A day before? Like, nobody does that. <laughs> you, yeah. you need to do that. Yeah. And then if you sit there and act like you're actually going to read it, they give you the stink eye because you're right. taking up their time. <laughs> like, no, this is my life I'm signing here. This thing says 30 years. Like, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is we, we just dealt with the power negotiation, which was chapter one. You've got a lot of other powers, the power of competition, power of proximity, power of timing, power of flexibility, power of household composition, power of relationship. I like that one. The power of focus, power of questions, and the power of accounting. Where do people get the book, Justin? So the book is available at rentalsecrets.net, which is my website for the book. It's also available at amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and other retailers online as well. What a great concept. And I hadn't heard of it before. So congratulations on some great work. And Thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes talking about negotiating on your rent. I appreciate it. Absolutely. No, it's a topic that needs to get out there more and help people you know, stack some Benjamins up. Welcome back to round two of our exciting game of fun and no prizes. Wait, there's no prize? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that. I should have, I should have saved that for the end. Actually, we have this. This will be your prize. Instead of a applause for everybody, it'll be applause just for you, OG. All right. The score, for those of you with short-term memory problems, is uh, Paula won. Nick has won. And OG has won. This round, it's two points. So, OG, you went last in the first round. You get to go first in the second round. We have six left on this list. Nine questions to ask yourself before starting a startup. What's still here? Ooh, um, I would ask, do I have the skills to do it? Do I have the skills to do it? It's not on the list. Okay. But I would think that if you, well, I mean, it's looking at it through. list. Looking, I quit. <laughs> looking at it through Kathy's point of view, though, I think if you're, if, if you're going into this, you probably think you have the skill already. Like you're already feeling kind of cocky, right? Okay, I can see that. Don't you think so? I mean, Nick, have you ever interviewed uh, somebody who's uh, who has a startup idea who lacks confidence? You got to at least have the confidence to put yourself out there and say this is something I charge money for. Yeah, I think that's that's got to be got to be number 1. I'm not saying I'm not saying your thing was off OG. Okay. Just no, saying, you don't have to that's, that's, you don't have to coddle me. <laughs> I got it wrong. A simple wrong would have done. Nick, <laughs> six left on here. What you got? How about what problem do you solve? Nice job, Nick. Point number two on here. She says, and this took a little judge's uh, conferring, by the way. Could you describe your new business in 30 seconds? But the first sentence is exactly what you said. Name the value proposition for your product or service, which is exactly the problem you, you, you solve. Then explain why you and only you are uniquely qualified to deliver it, be able to do this in 30 seconds or less. I don't know if, if do you need the 30 second pitch, Nick? I mean, I, I don't know. It's helpful to have either, you know, maybe not a 30 second, like, you know, elevator pitch, but a quick way to explain what it is that you do and who you do it for. I think that's really helpful, both in helping people understand what you do and so they can potentially refer other people to you like, hey, I know a guy who does exactly that. Do you think if you can't do it in 30 seconds or less, maybe her point is it's too complicated? Could be. Yeah. All right, Paula. Nick has the lead. Mm -hmm. It is your move. For the tie. Ooh. So much drama. Wait a minute. While you're thinking, no, I don't know. 
Here we go. I am going to guess that one of the questions on that list is how do I market or promote my product or service? Is for the tie, how do I market or promote my service or business on the list? Oh, I think that's important. And what's funny is, is, is I look at her points, which I'll get to here in a second. And I think she kind of talks around it, but directly not a marketing plan. But Nick, back to you, back to the chief side hustler. It seems like Paula's got a good point there. Wouldn't you need to have some type of a marketing plan right from the beginning? Yeah. How is this, how is this not on the list? Like, how are you going to find customers? How are customers going to find you? Critically important question to know. She does say is number five, how much will customers be willing to pay? So she does say that, but she doesn't. She's got kind of a pricing question. Yeah. But how are you going to find those customers? Doesn't make her list. Oh, gee, I think having been in the same business that you're in, that marketing is where a lot of people fail in the business of financial advising. Well, it's where people fail in every business. Yeah, true. You know, I mean, you could be the best salesperson in the world, but if nobody comes into the building, it won't matter. When you look at the reasons why businesses don't work, it's largely due to capitalization issues, right? That's because they don't have a constant stream of new business coming in to innovate and to continually refresh the coffer, so to speak. And business owners are habitually people who think they can do it better and probably can. And then they just take all the money out of the company every t- every chance they can, and they don't use it to reinvest. And, and marketing is one of those things that if you've got that licked, then there's constantly new money coming in. There's new product that you can produce. There's new solutions that you can provide for your clients along the way. I was advising a guy on his business. Um, Stop signs. I know we heard. A while ago. No, no, no. I didn't advise that guy. Uh, I met that guy. But, uh, but but I was advising a guy in his business. And You're like, do not make go signs. It's totally out of your niche. <laughs> yeah. Stick with stop, man. Stick with stop. It's, it's there everywhere. <laughs> yes. Yield. Yes. When it came to his marketing problem, he continually thought if he just made the product better, like more people would come. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. And, and it seems like a lot of entrepreneurs do this where they think, if, if I just keep making the product better, somebody will notice. But I often see out there products that aren't as well made, but much better, better marketed. Well, sure. I mean, you look at just about anything that's mass produced and yeah. it's generally produced the lowest possible way that they can do it, but they spend all of their money on research development and marketing. Look at the look at the uh, income statements from most large organizations, you know, the, where do they spend all of their money? They spend it on product innovation and on uh, and on marketing. So and on marketing, yeah. You know, take a clue, I guess. Nick Loper, you're the big winner here. All right. Nice job. He's so excited. It's it's palpable. <laughs> I mean, he just right? he's like, yeah, cool. <laughs> so what do I get a gift card to Sizzler? I can, t- I can tell Nick's going to brag about that for about 30 seconds, maybe, maybe 25 seconds. How do you feel, Nick? I feel outstanding. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. It is our uh, time for, we got done with one challenge. We got to go right into another. It's time for Doug standing right here next to me, Doug and his trivia. So uh, let's take Doug's trivia challenge, shall we? Hey there, game show audience. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I haven't heard a peep from you at all actually hey look you know what i don't care who you are put your hands in the air like you just don't care come on what well if if you're driving maybe just keep one hand on the wheel clap with just clap with one hand let's take all this sourest day energy and focus it on something more productive shall we your trivia doug you ask person who has yet again inserted yourself into my script what could you possibly ask about sourest day well i'll tell you what could be more sour than the dish with sour in its name sauerkraut apparently og isn't alone in loving this vinegar infused cabbage nastiness here's today's question just how many pounds of sauerkraut does america eat annually I'll be back with your answer right after the break. All right. We explained the rules to this game to uh, Nick behind the scenes. Nick, do you understand the convoluted rules of this year game? 
Got it. All right. For everybody at home all year long, uh, Paula, OG, and Len, on whom behalf of our friend Nick is playing today, the three of them have had a competition and currently our trivia score for the year, Len has 10. Paula just moved up to tie him with 10. Woo-hoo! And OG has nine, which means, OG, you get to decide first. Would you like to go first in the middle or last? I will go first. Uh, wow. That is that is a ch- he he must know Paula. He knows something. Wow. Would you like All right. to, Yes. Uh, uh Nick, would you like to go in the middle or last? Um middle's fine. Middle is fine. So Paula gets the gets the driver's seat. So how many OG pounds of sauerkraut here on Sour's Day? Does the average American eat per year? This number is not a big number. So sauerkraut is like nasty cabbage in vinegar cooked all day. So if you ate a spoonful of it every six to nine years by accident, (laughs) how many pounds of that turn into (laughs) per person? It's like squash. This is the worst food imaginable. And I take that back. The question Doug asked was not the one I just asked you. Oh, I wasn't listening to Doug at all, so you you should ask again. How many pounds in total do Americans eat? Oh, okay. All right, so there's 300 million Americans. We each eat a spoonful of it every six years. Uh, Each spoonful is like four ounces. How many ounces are in a pound? Does anybody know? 16. Thank you. So four Americans equal one pound. I have no freaking idea. Um, I'm going to say that we eat in total 683,000 pounds. 683,000 pounds. I have no idea. Nick, I know you're a big sauerkraut fan. Yeah, for every for every OG who uh, who doesn't touch it, there's got to be somebody on the other end of the spectrum who's eating just, <laughs> just you know, buckets gobs full of this right? stuff every day. And for that um, person, by the way, we have native deodorant. So, th- <laughs> <laughs> so it, you, your guess was 683,000? Yes. Doug made it sound like it was some obscenely high number. I'm going to go with like 200 million. 200. Oh, and that is so good because you just made it so difficult for Paula. <laughs> wow. Okay. That means that my... <laughs> My choices are either 684,000 or one. You don't think it's 201 million? No, I don't, I don't think the answer is going to be more than 200 million. So do which, bra- which bracket do I want to guess in? Do I want to guess 684,000 or do I want to guess one? Essentially, the question is, do I believe that the answer is greater than or less than OG's guess? Oof. 300 million Americans. Oh, man. Oh, this is hard. But this is going to count restaurant consumption, too. Don't, don't forget Oktoberfest. I'm going to go with 684,000. That's Bush League. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 1,000 higher. Well, All the right. good news is, OG, if it's 683,500. <laughs> then you, then everyone's going to say it's rigged. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> That you were looking at my paper while we went. All right. Uh, You know what? We're going to let you know, but we're going to let you know in just a moment the answer to this question. Well, it's funny having Nick Loper here today to talk business planning. And you know that we're always on the lookout for ways to help you either start your new business, get rolling on it, or do better in your business. And as somebody who's self-employed, if you're not using Intuit QuickBooks for your financial management needs, well, you should be. It'll save you time, money, and most of all, a lot of the headaches you're dealing with now. Here's just a little bit about QuickBooks. It makes payday super easy. You can run payroll in less than five minutes with Intuit QuickBooks Payroll. Here's some things that we like about it. Number one, the setup was super easy. You can access hours and pay employees and contractors all in one easy place. Submit payroll for your whole team right up until the day before payday. Employees can visit their pay stubs anytime via the online employee portal. You just give that to them and they can log in themselves whenever they want, making you look like a shooter, even though you have a small company. I love how companies like Intuit QuickBooks are 
squeezing that gap between the big employer and the small employer, you know, because a lot of the time when I was a financial planner and people are evaluating careers like, well, this, this big company has got some of these great benefits. And even if you can't go toe to toe with them, the fact that you can do many of these same things, you can mimic them a lot and a small workplace has the potential to be more of a family atmosphere. It's a lot of good reasons people would rather work with you. And this is just another one. Of course, saying that, that means there's technology you can trust. You can rest easy knowing every paycheck's correct. Payroll tax calculations are done for you. You can file and pay federal and state taxes yourself or have QuickBooks handle them for you. They have a 100% penalty-free guarantee. QuickBooks won't just resolve the filing errors. They'll also pay any penalty fees too. Intuit QuickBooks payroll is options for businesses of all sizes. So if you're anywhere from one all the way up to 150 employees, QuickBooks payroll is for you. Listen to this. You can save an average of $600 annually by paying your employees with Intuit QuickBooks payroll. Check it out today at intuit.me slash SB. That's intuit.me slash SB. I like how that sounds. Nick, you are grossly higher than the rest of them at 200 million pounds of sauerkraut. I think gross is appropriate. You feeling confident? I don't know. He made it sound like it was some really high number. Yeah. Paula, why did you go 1,000 higher than OGs and not not, uh, go with one? You know, 300 million people in America, I'm sure. I mean, I I just feel like anything in the 100,000s. 683,000 still seemed like kind of a low guess in it's, it's a big gap the, to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's a big gap to play and uh and given the the population of America, it seemed like seemed like I should err on the side of of more. Hey, OG, you got that clean thousand there she gave you. Yeah. Good stuff. It's well, great. Doug, take it from here, man. What's our answer? Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you ever wonder how these guys put a game around my real life and the original, I might add, game show? Well, that's that's both of us, you and me, but I won't get sour about that. I got a job to do. So before the break, I left you with some trivia to noodle on. Here was your question. How many pounds of sauerkraut does America eat annually? And the answer... Well, if you're anything like me, you're, you're probably shocked. If you guessed a gram, a gram over 387 million pounds, you're wrong, totally wrong. However, if you guessed, well, if you guessed 387 million pounds on the dot, then you're you're right. You're right. You should know that, but you're right. Tell you what, there's definitely some puckering going on in the basement today over that answer. See ya. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I didn't do the math very good on that. No, I think... Uh, as, as, after Paula was talking about the number of people and pounds per people, I was like, oh, I actually ended up with like, you know, what is that, 1% yeah. Percent yeah, not of cl- a pound? Yeah, it's not... It's, it's not like not. per year, a pound of it per year, yeah. more than a pound per year per person. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, a much higher per capita consumption than I would guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah somebody, I did guess. Somebody's eating a ton more sauerkraut than I am. Right, because we got to average out the four of us who are like not bringing a lot of sauerkraut <laughs> consumption to the table. But I think I think Nick is the first person who's ever been on here who was playing the inflection in Doug's voice to, to decide <laughs> his answer. That's that's fantastic. So Nick, congratulations on helping Len get one closer to the win. I'm sure he'll share the big prize at the end of the year with you. Awesome. Yes. Hey, let's help somebody magnify their money, guys. And today we're reading you a question that comes to you courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you'll find those financial products you use every day are nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of the products available online, all ranked at magnify money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more. You know, we really wanted to do something entrepreneurial with Nick here, and we didn't have any really entrepreneurial questions in the queue. So we went to Reddit because we found a fascinating question there and distilled down the question is this. This person's trying to build up their own business. They write, I'm trying to build up my own business, but I might be getting fired soon for my day job. What should I do? Person writes, appreciate some advice here. 
I work for a local college as the marketing guy. Not great money, just shy of 18,000 pounds a year. I would guess, Paula, they're not in America at 18,000 pounds a year. Well, I mean, even in the UK, that's going to be almost nothing. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 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 somewhere in the, what, 25, 20, 27,000 range, maybe, if, if my math is right. Yeah, it's, it's, it is not good pay. That's certainly... Yeah. Correct. And by the way, if you are in the U.S. and getting paid in pounds, you want to talk to your HR. But I was pulled into a meeting last week and they're essentially launching an investigation into why I won't pass an exam prior to my contractual deadline of January 2020, which is when my employment would have been made permanent. It's a high level project management exam, which I attempted two months ago after being put on a week's course. They told me it'll take two weeks from Monday, after which I may be dismissed 30 days notice from then. Got to be honest, wasn't particularly bothered as my as my head's been out of the place for months anyway. I've been working on launching my own marketing agency and web business. I also offer AWS Cloud Consulting, and I've got a few local businesses on retainer at what's a good rate, but slightly lower than competitors to prove my worth. I can certainly say it's had an impact on my job, all-nighters before work, etc. I've also developed a managed WordPress platform that's picking up as the products finish. The plan, however, was to keep working while building up a client base and so I could cover any business expenses. Part of me says I'm screwed now, but the other part says ham my notice in ASAP and focus on bringing in clients ASAP as the income for my job isn't hard to match and I've done no real marketing myself due to time. Any thoughts on this? Got ideas to bring some in and referrals seem to be working. So any thoughts on that too? Am I screwed or can I get out of this? OG, we'll start with you. Read it again. (laughs) (laughs) Does he save his day job? Yeah. I mean, doesn't sound like he really wants to work very hard at it, but if they want to keep paying you for a little while, why would you walk away from it? But it looks like he's getting fired in the next 30 days. Great. So get 30 more days of pay. Quit on the 29th day. Have your resignation letter ready. So when they go, hey, dude, you got to talk to the boss, go, I don't think so. And then give them the resignation letter. (laughs) You know, I mean, why do you want to take 30 days of not earning money? I don't get that. So pretty much stay until they fire you. Till the last minute. I don't know that I would want the, I got fired from my job on my resume, but by the same token, you're kind of on the way, you are on the way out anyway. Maybe everybody knows that. Maybe everybody can tell. Maybe you're a bad poker player and everybody can read it on your face. I don't know. I don't see why. I mean, you still have to do the job, right? I'm not suggesting that you go to work and like kick your heels up and just say, well, screw it. I'm going to make them pay me for the next two pay cycles or whatever, but it's 1500 bucks. Paula? It sounds like they don't pay him very well. Doesn't sound like they treat him that well either. Sounds like they don't really want him to be around. And it sounds like he doesn't really want to be around. So all of the ingredients are present for him and his current day job to part ways. And it looks like that's going to be the natural course of events anyway. Meanwhile, he seems very excited about this side hustle that he's been developing. He's already got clients. He's got a lot of good prospects. I would lean into that and just go full force in that. You know, and if that means that he needs to frugal down a little bit, I mean, he's already not making very much. So I don't know if there's a whole lot more that he can cut. But it sounds as though, given the fact that he's already successful at his side hustle, it sounds as though if he puts all of his energy into that, I think he could very quickly have that exceeding what he's making at his current day job in not that much time. And one of the Unexpected benefits of not making a whole lot of money at your day job is that if your goal is to grow your side hustle income to the point where it exceeds what you're making at your day job and you don't make very much at your day job, well, guess what? Now the bar is lower. So that's an easier goal to surpass. Yeah. You mean also I would think that his expenses can't be all that high because he's used to living on a very frugal income. Exactly. Would you take OG's advice though and work till the last minute before you hand it in just so you have that extra money on the side? Yeah, may as well stay until it's time for you and your company to part ways. Um, It sounds like that's going to be coming up in a few weeks at most based on the way he's written this. So may as well. Nick, you got to see this all the time, I would think, where somebody reaches this inflection point, right? They got this thing on the side. They got their main job. I remember I even had it with my job where my boss called me into his office and said I was talking about my side job too much at work and he wanted to fire me because I seemed to be too excited about that, not excited enough about my main job. You must see this all the time. Yeah. And the the metric that I typically use is to have your side 
job or your side hustle making enough to cover your expenses, which it, it doesn't sound like our uh, Reddit guy is quite there yet, but given an extra 40, 50 hours a week, depending how long his commute is, what his hours are like, like, could he get there? I think with the foundation that he's built and the client base that he's built already, it seems like he has a pretty clear path forward to get there and beyond. It sounds like it's time for him to build a spreadsheet, I would think. I don't know if he needs a spreadsheet as much as he needs to figure out, okay, what is it realistically going to take in terms of new business to get me to where I need to be on a, on a monthly basis? Yeah. My frustration was, was that I don't know, you know, we're assuming he's doing very well because he's excited about it, but there's no listing of the actual numbers. Like, I don't know how close he is. I mean, Paula, just because he's excited about these clients and he thinks they're doing well, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't mean he's, he's making enough money. Yeah. I mean, he mentioned that he has a couple of clients on retainer. So those clients are paying him a regular monthly income. I would focus on getting more of those, you know, and I, I and you're right. I don't know what his expenses are and how much money his side hustle is currently bringing in. But based on the way that he described his prospects, it sounds as though he believes that he should be able to ramp this up fairly rapidly. And I would certainly focus first and foremost on ramping up the monthly retainer type of clients because that's how you build that uh, that stability. That's your bond allocation, so to speak. Nick, I want to ask you one more thing, which is this part that where he says, I've got a few local businesses on retainer at a good rate, but slightly lower than competitors to prove my worth. It seems like new entrepreneurs are really worried about that. Is competing on price like that super important? Depending on the niche, it can be important to build out a portfolio. Like I'll give the example of my wife and her partner in their photography business. They did their first few weddings for incredibly cheap because those brides were taking a risk. Like these people have nice pictures of families, but they've never shot a wedding before. Right. And so it made sense to do that. So the next season, they could considerably increase their rates. And maybe it's similar here. Like I need to build up a little bit of a portfolio, some client testimonials that'll make it easier to to get the next handful of clients in the door. I'm so glad uh, that, that our producer, Richie, found this question. By the way, if you've got a question, whether it's on personal finance or entrepreneurship, whatever, anything about earning, saving, or spending, send it to us. Uh, if you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, you can leave us your question there. Guys, that's going to do it for today. Nick, thanks so much for hanging out with us today, man. You bet. Thanks for having me. It's good to catch up. Well, it is good to get I feel like it's been way too long. The last time I hung out with you, we sat next to each other at the Plutus Awards, like uh, just over, it's, it's been over a year. That's right. You won and I won and it was a good night. It was a great night. And Paula won big that night. Remember I the, did. Yes. Paula won like uh, best person on earth, whatever that award was. Yeah. Like <laughs> lifetime achievement. Yeah. It was, it was big time. Yes. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, what's coming up on side on the side hustle show? We got lots of good stuff coming up. We met a guy who was a former door to door salesman. Actually, met him at FinCon. He started an online business that's now doing six figures in uh, just under two years. I was really excited about that one. And then met another listener or connected with another listener who has an aquarium maintenance business. Totally random offline side hustle that you know he still works just fifteen at twenty hours a week at it and says he makes. 70, 80 grand a year cleaning out fish tanks at the dentist office. I was really? Like, I never knew that was, I walked past this business idea twice a year and have been doing it for years, never even thought about it. But that's a, that's a fun one that's coming up too. That's fantastic. And that's the Side Hustle Show, wherever finer podcasts are distributed, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Paula, what's happening at the Afford Anything podcast? What? Before I go into that, I'll just say I actually just hired somebody to clean out my aquarium. I have a turtle who lives in an aquarium. I just hired someone. I've been doing it myself for years, five years. <laughs> so um, there you go. Business ideas are everywhere. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm one of those clients now. Uh, so on the Afford Anything podcast, uh, I think on a previous episode of Stacking Benjamins, I said that we were going to have Noah Kagan on the show. We will still have him on the show, but that is not going to air until later. So sometime in November, you can listen for Noah Kagan as he talks about how he built an eight-figure business. What we have on the Afford Anything podcast right now is Ryan Holiday. He is a best-selling author. He has written a book about stillness. 
and why it's essential for success in every arena of life, whether that's work, family relationships, just your own personal mental and emotional health. So he writes about how to incorporate stillness into the busyness of daily life. And Ryan and I talk about that on the Afford Anything podcast. I also have Michael Robinson from Uncommon Dream, who talks about seven ways to escape the rat race. That episode is coming up this upcoming Monday. Wow. I love the idea, by the way, not that escaping the rat race isn't important, but I love the idea of uh, stillness. It's something I found as I try to put more stillness in my day, like my days just get remarkably better. Absolutely. And he gives uh, some great examples of of leaders who, even in hectic, very stressful situations, I shouldn't say even, especially in those tumultuous situations, they use the practice of stillness to make better decisions about how to handle those trying times. Oh, gee, you got anything crazy coming up? Halloween. That's fantastic. What are you going to dress up as? I am pretty sure that I am going to be Jafar. My daughter is Jasmine. Her grandfather, my father-in-law, is going to be in town, so we're going to try to convince him to be the genie. He could fit the part. Maybe Mrs. OG will be the genie. We haven't figured it out yet, but that's yes. that's awesome. I saw a Halloween costume that I'm thinking about now, where where the, this guy's dressed all in black, and he built like a stage around where his head goes, and it's all black background except for his head comes to the stage and a little like a marionette puppet with like things. So it's his head and a puppet and you can move like the arms and the legs. It's really creepy. It's, it's, a, it, I don't know if you even understand what I'm talking about, but he's dressed all in black and there's a puppet that goes maybe down halfway down his chest yeah. with his huge head as the head in this, in this Makes play. Sense, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Creepy stuff. Uh, we got creepy stuff coming a couple of weeks from now. We're going to have our Halloween episode. That'll be fun. All right, guys, that's going to do it. Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Yeah, sure. Fine, Joe. Yeah, whatever, man. I'll do your work for you. Again, telling people what they should have learned. God, anyway, first, uh, uh, are you starting a business? Ask yourself a, a few times. Are you enamored with the idea of owning a business? Are you ready to just ask yourself some hard questions? Because it's very different. Second, take some advice from Justin in his book, Rental Secrets. If you're looking to find out more about your rental, learning to negotiate your rent is step one to saving possibly like a whole giant pile of cash. But the big lesson here on Sourest Day, if you decided to rank your fruits on how sour they are, I'd say uh, pretty much all of them are sublime. Thanks to Nick Loper for coming down to the basement. You can find Nick's show, Side Hustle Nation, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Or, uh, you know, just check him out on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Justin Pogue for giving us some insight on rental properties. You can find out more about him and his book, Rental Secrets, on our show notes page. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com and the Afford Anything podcast. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Lastly, thanks to Joe's mom for explaining why OG eats sauerkraut every Friday. Turns out he's just trying to freshen up a little bit. You know, make himself smell a little. Oh, God, no, no, no. Oh, gee, do not come stand by me. Come, come.
I love it when podcasting meets pop culture and having uh, Nick here and Paula and OG. I thought this from Saturday Night Live was was pretty fun. Let's play a little clip of, uh, well, you'll hear. The father-son relationship. It's one of the most important bonds in the world. But we all know talking to your son isn't always easy. What is that? Just one of my inventions. Sure. But now every father can break through to his son using the Father-Son Podcasting Microphone. With the Father-Son Podcasting Microphone, you and your son can start to have real meaningful conversations. And today I am joined by my co-host, my son. It's great to be here, Dad. Dad and son can finally open up to each other using the comforting cadence and structure of a podcast. I'd say my dad's distant. Well, it's tough, you know. I mean, there's no book you can read about being a dad. Actually, there are several. The podcast is a great chance for father and son to get raw, confessional, and unfiltered. I guess looking back on my life so far... I've done everything in order to gain my dad's approval. But sometimes things get too real. Luckily, you can always shift gears with a quick commercial. You know what I do approve of? Squarespace. You want to make a beautiful website in no time? Squarespace has you covered. Choose from hundreds of stunning templates or start from scratch. And our listeners can get started for free with promo code SUNLOVEDAD. Well, you nailed that, kiddo. With the Father Son Podcast, your conversations can be divided into easily digestible segments. Well, it turns out vasectomies don't always take. And that wraps up this week's edition of Family Secrets. (laughs) Plus... And they go into uh, how it's adjustable for when your son gets older. That's great. Nick, uh, how old are your uh, little lopers? My boys are three and a half and one and a half. I, you already have these, don't you? I, I can't wait to get the kid on the show. Actually, he um, he did provide a uh, a hustle on for some outro a long time ago. <laughs> like, almost as soon as he could talk. I was like, here, talk into this thing. Oh, Paula, you going to do this with your cats? Have like the, the Paula cat microphone bonding moment? Totally. And the turtle. I mean, <laughs> the turtle. <laughs> a whole zoo of uh, animals that I can bring on this podcast. <laughs> but it's funny. I wish I would have seen that live. But that that, is, that was really good. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, that really good. yeah you got to do that with the OG kids. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get them on, by the way. You guys ever bring your kids on? I think my kids have been on a long time ago. I don't think the boys have been on in a while. On our off weeks, Nick, we have an intern come down and clean the basement and take over, and they play Greatest Hits episodes. And our first intern, now it's the Finn turn, Griffin the intern. Now, the first one, though, was my daughter. Actually, it was Autumn the intern. It was funny. She did it for maybe four episodes. And then one day, she just, I don't want to do this anymore, Dad. I don't want to do this. Like, oh, I, I never said you had to do it. No, I'm done. I'm done right now. I'm like, that's fine. No, you don't hear me, Dad. I'm done. I'm not doing it. Oh, okay. That's fine. Nick never, my son never wanted to do it. Weird. Yeah. Maybe you should get the, uh, but maybe I need to get the podcasting. The son, father podcasting equipment. Yeah. But seriously, though, Paula, don't you feel like you have different and sometimes better conversations because you have a microphone in front of you than you could ever have with some of these people that you interview? You know, I do, but I think the reason for that is because. When I'm doing an interview, it's understood that the conversation will be me asking questions and the other person responding. And so there isn't this pressure to have a two-way give and take. I can just inhabit the role of a person who asks questions and we can go deep into understanding the ideas, the thoughts, the mindset of whomever is on the other end of that microphone. And I think that's what allows for the, the additional depth you know, because you don't have the seesaw back and forth. Yeah, listening to your interviews, Nick, you always seem like you're intensely interested in what the person's doing. Like, how much is that an interview and how much of that is Nick Loper's just curious? Yeah, re- there's, there's a ton of the curiosity <laughs> that just comes into play. So the mic gives you an excuse to talk to people you otherwise never would, right? It's like, hey, can I talk to you on my podcast? Like, if I just wanted to call you up on the phone, like, that would be a <laughs> that would be a hard pass, right? And it gives you permission to ask stuff that you might otherwise not normally ask. Like, well, how much are you making from that? Or, you know, why, why did you do it that way? What do you think about it? Because in in person, at least, like I would, I would probably not go there, but it's like, well, for the sake of the listeners, like, and my own curiosity, like I better ask that. 
It was funny when you were interviewing our mutual friend, Jonathan Mendonza at Choose FI. Like, I know you were writing down half of what he was saying as much as I was. I was listening to the two of you, like, furiously writing down as Jonathan's giving (laughs) us his playbook. (laughs) It was so fun. I want to ask that you, though, Nick, have you ever had any of your interviews go into awkward territory? There have been a few that haven't been published. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, but that's a great answer. Like, you're like, no, it, it this isn't good. Yeah, this is like, this just isn't doing it for me. Like, let's hit a timeout. In, in some cases, like, I'll usually take responsibility. Like, I didn't come up with a tight enough story arc or timeline or or kind of outline. Like, we're trying to cover too much history in 45 minutes, and it's it's just not working. But it's far better for the ones you can't salvage to keep it awkward between two people than tens of thousands of people. Yeah. Paul, have you had any that you haven't published? Yeah. Yeah. I've had uh, probably five or six interviews that I haven't published. Oftentimes those have been the interviews in which the guests answers are too generic. If it sounds as though they're repeating a bunch of platitudes and not really going into depth about how they did something or what they're, if, if they don't have an original idea to share and they don't have a compelling story that is laden with specific actionable tips, then what's the point? And the way that I think about it is if I air a subpar interview, then every single person who spends an hour listening to that episode, I've just wasted an hour of their time. So who am I to waste an hour of tens of thousands of people's time. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Ours is funny because we want to have I say we have tons of stuff that's on air. <laughs> <Stanky laughs> yes. Actually ours is ours so so Steve Stewart, who is a fantastic engineer, actually for the holidays last year sent OG and I a disc and he said these are the only two copies of the disc. I've deleted everything and and here you go. And I don't know. It was maybe what a day later, OG, that you called me and said, have you listened to that disc yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't had time. He goes, well, two things. Number one is we'll never be able to run for public office if this gets out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. And and number two, you're like, I'm, I'm on the ground because it was so damn funny. Yeah. So the whole goal of our show is to make each other laugh. I, I think that's so. From day one. Yes. None of this should be published. So there you go. <laughs> that's right. true. <laughs> 